Welcome to Community Matters on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today, we're going to talk about Kim Coco Iwamoto, who has unseated House Speaker Scott Psyche. How will this change things in the legislature? Our guest for the show is Vicki Caetano, Hawaii's former first lady. Welcome to the show, Vicki. Thank you, Jay. I'm pleased to be here and to have a great discussion on what sounds like a very interesting topic. Well, this was a really remarkable um, election here. It was tight. It was contentious. District 25, uh, where Kim Coco Iwamoto unseated uh, Scott Psyche, who served in the House uh, since 1994 and has been a speaker since May, the speaker since May 2017. She lost to Psyche in two prior elections with less than 200 votes. Um, she mounted a very strong campaign against him for the District 25 seat, which covers Ala Moana, Kaka'ako, and downtown Honolulu. And this is a quotable quote, Vicki. She said, I wasn't just campaigning against him. I was campaigning against the entire Democratic establishment. And I hope you can help me understand and in, in, you know, interpret what has happened, because it is uh, remarkable. Um, so let's ask the general question first. What happened here? Well, how come she won? She beat Scott Psyche, who you would assume would be a very popular legislator as a longtime speaker. Well, you know, I'll tell you what I find really interesting, too, is that Speaker Psyche came off of a rather successful, I thought, session. You know, they passed the biggest tax cut for residents. And so you would think that people were very happy. Uh, they did things like the addressing the condo insurance crises and a number of other things. And uh, I think he really tried to show, which he did, have tremendous experience and collaboration. So much so that the governor, Josh Green, even campaigned for him, which typically one doesn't do in a primary. So that was a, a real effort, I think, on his part to say, elect Scott Psyche, we all work so well together. So I'm really surprised also that after such a relatively successful session, passing the biggest tax cut in our history for residents, that he basically got booted out. And, and this was, of course, her third uh, effort, her third attempt uh, to unseat him. And this time she was successful. Uh, I will say in talking to people on both sides that while he did have a tremendous support, a lot of longtime supporters, I found that the people who supported her were extremely enthusiastic with their support, with their candidate. And they were like, third time is a charm. We are going to make it. And, and I found that very interesting, that they were just very enthusiastic is the word I would use in how they supported their candidate, Kim Coco Iwamoto. Just a footnote, though, you know, we have we do have enthusiasm at the national level for uh, Kamala Harris. And I wonder if this is a kind of reflection, an echo of that kind of enthusiasm right here at home. What do you think? Well, I think so. You know, people always want to talk about change. Uh, that's why I'm a little surprised still that there was change. They did pass a big tax cut. But the, the phrase all along is bringing change. I think one has to define what that change is, especially when you keep in mind that although she is now the representative elect for this district, she's not the speaker. You know, that's going to go through an internal process at the legislature uh, among the representatives as to who they elect to be the next speaker. And it's very unlikely that it will be a freshman representative like Kim Coco Iwamoto. So with that said, you know, it begs the question, how much change can a new representative really affect? Yeah, so it's likely to be somebody who's an experienced longtime legislator to replace an experienced longtime legislator. Um, mm -hmm. And I just wonder, uh, you know, we, we ought to spend a little time on that question. Who are the forces? Who are the people? We're not talking about, um, you know, the electorate. We're, we're not talking about the constituents. Um, this is not a mm, public process, if you will. This is uh, some people in the ledge, in the government, who are going to make this decision. Can you talk about the process and, and who, at least from the outside in, 
are the players. You know, you've probably read, as I've heard, uh, a few names. Uh, I think first and foremost is a Representative Nadine Nakamura. Uh, you know, Nadine actually came onto the scene when Ben was governor, and uh, she's seasoned, experienced, very level-headed. Um, she's got a good head on her shoulders, and she works well with people. Uh, so I've heard that she is definitely one of the front runners, as is Linda Ichiyama. Uh, they've talked about the finance chair, Kyle Yamashita. However, what I'm I'm hearing is that he really likes where he's at. You know, that's a very powerful position. I'm not sure he's that interested to give that up. Uh, but along the lines, as you say, um, on the national scene, you know, it, it's there's a groundswell of support that change can at least look differently, a woman. Um, and so I think locally, there may be a push as well to have the first female speaker of the house in the state of Hawaii. Yeah, you mentioned she's a woman, and I just want to ask you, what what role did the fact that she's a, a trans uh, play in all of this? you think that helped her, hurt her? Um, wh where does that fit? What does it say about Hawaii? What does it say about the people who voted for her? What does it say about the future of legislative elections? What do you think? Well, if you look at the campaign, there's very little talk about that. And I think uh, what little I know of Kim Koko Iwamoto, it is one thing. She wants to stand on a record. She wants to stand on what she can accomplish, you know, not just about what she is. And uh, of course, she, she, I think, wants to advocate for the underserved and those whose voice maybe uh, are not often as heard. But with that said, I think she's all about bringing something significant to the uh, arena of public service and making impact to change things for the betterment of the community, specifically for those who are more underserved. Uh, how she can accomplish that is another story, but I really think that's what she campaigned more on than about her uh, gender. Oh yeah, well, she's been, she's been on Think Tech a number of times and she's very articulate, very smart, uh, a, a perfect personality. Um, you know, to be elected. Uh, I, and I think really to, 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 to go to that question, I think it really speaks volumes about Hawaii. No, it wasn't that important. No, the electorate really didn't care. Um, and it, it means something. Uh, it's, it means something about us, about the state. And I think we should be proud of not caring about that. Don't you agree? I agree. I think it just shows really the need for us as a society to be more tolerant of each other, to look at our differences, not as a, a means to divide us, but as a means to unify us. And, and so I really hope that if anything, that is a message that people will hear when they look at her and what she stands for, tolerance. But she also stands for political positions. And, uh, you know, one of the big questions is uh, what, what political platforms, what policy points will she bring? Uh, how will she differ from legislators in the past? How will she differ aside from being speaker or not being speaker? What what will what will she bring in terms of public policy? Well, you know, she's uh, had a fair amount of some you know uh, experience in the political arena. She's ran for office several times now, so I don't think she's as uh, new to the scene as perhaps sometimes the campaign portrayed her to be. Uh, let's hope she uses that knowledge and that experience in a collaborative manner so that uh, we can get new things done, specifically reform at the ledge. Uh, I like that one of the things she spoke about was that, you know, things that a bill that's brought to a committee should not be killed just because the chairperson doesn't hear it or isn't available or wants to hear it. That's not right. You know, the will of the people deserves to be heard. And uh, so I like that point that she brought up. Now, talking about it and getting it done are two different things. So certainly she is now the elect in there and whether, uh, I don't think she'll be speaker, certainly not in this first round, but still, even as a freshman representative, you can affect change if you're, um, collaborative enough, and if you're savvy enough to get people to work together. I think that's the true test of what a leader is all about. 
So whoever you know does get to be speaker here, um, because uh, Scott Psyche is no longer in the legislature at all for now, um, you know, it raises the question for discussion about you know what does the speaker do? What are the special powers? What are the special obligations? Um, you know, I remember, for example, that committee appointments are very important in the House as they are in the Senate. Um, and the speaker has, a, you know, almost total control over that. Uh, so query, you know, what is the special power, you know, now that we're looking at it, that the speaker has? You know, Jay, I don't think that uh, as powerful as the speaker is, I don't think they can single handedly appoint. They can. But if there's pushback, it can create such a distraction that they really can't get things done. So with that said, I think their role is to steer the leadership uh, of the House of Representatives in line with both the executive uh, branch as well as the Senate side to all work together. And yet not, you know, you have to be lockstep in the direction and yet not be like cohorts where you're on a buddy buddy system, you know, you scratch my back. I scratch yours kind of thing that the public won't tolerate that anymore. But yet it's this fine line, right? Between being collaborative and being a quid pro quo kind of, of a leader, which you don't want. Uh, so I think that the next speaker uh, of the house would bode well to have this experience and the ability to pull people together and navigate through obviously a significant change in the legislature. Yeah, that's what it speaks of, doesn't it? Not to use that term. Um, and and I think we can look forward to new ideas. You know, it raises the question, not only between you and me here, about what the speaker does, what the speaker's powers are, um, how the speaker can leverage things in one agenda or another. Um, but it also raises it for the public. And the public ought to be interested, for example, as you mentioned, in transparency. Uh, the, the public ought to be interested in all kinds of issues maybe that haven't been covered in that much detail up till now. So although you could say that um, 2024 was a good year um, for Scott Psyche and the legislature, largely because of that tax uh, cut, uh, there are lots of other platform points that need to be covered. And maybe new ideas, new people in that job uh, would raise those ideas. For example, you know, have we been doing enough on climate change? Um, ha didn't Maui show us that we could have a disaster that would cost the state a fortune to recover from. Um, and there are still fires burning. And so we have to be resilient. And my question to you is, uh, is it a good idea to have a tax cut uh, when we're looking down the pike at climate change, which is happening all over the world and which, you know, which we need to have a, a fund, a reserve um, to deal with. So that could be one of the changes. Uh, if I was speaker, right, I would uh, emphasize that. What do you think? What kinds of things will come up now? Well, I agree with you on that, Jay. And uh, those I know who opposed the tax cut said there's so many other demands. But my point in bringing that up was that on the surface, it really looked like a successful session to the residents. You know, people always, they say there's that saying, right? You vote where your pocketbook is. <laughs> but you know, so in that sense, I was surprised that of all the times, this was the year that he got ousted. Uh, but with that said, climate change, we've learned from Lahaina or certainly should have learned. Uh, I agree with you. I don't see as much being done as, as they've talked about, you know, and that's always the difference, I feel, between being a politician and being a leader. It's easy to talk. It's easy to promise. But now to deliver. And that's where the next speaker, together with the Senate president, I think that relationship is very key and working with the governor. I mean, those three legs really are what you need to get meaningful legislation passed, working together. Uh, so I hope that uh, two things will happen, that the next speaker of the house will be able to do that. And I hope that Kim Koko Iwamoto will uh, be to an extent the voice uh, of talking about reform, um, even if she's not in there like a, as a seasoned legislator on her first day, but still to be vocal. And I think she will be in that sense 
uh, about talking about these things that sometimes seasoned politicians would rather ignore. Well, the other side of the coin is um, is Scott. Um, you know, uh, Josh Green um, mentioned that his heart goes out to Scott Psyche. And I, you know, here's a guy who served for, for what, 30 years in the State House of Representatives. That's really quite something. And, and I'm sure he, you know, ha has served the people of Hawaii well, if he yes. stayed in office that long. So it, you ha your heart has to go out to him. And I guess my question to you is, what, what does he do now? I know he hasn't made an announcement about it. It's too fresh. But query, what does a guy who has been the speaker, who has been in the House for 30 years, what does he do with himself? What will he do with himself? Make yourself him. What would you do? Well, I think that uh, given all his years of experience, that he will spend some time at least uh, to be uh, of counsel, to support, especially some of the newer representatives. Obviously, it's hard for to support his opponent now in his seat, you know, in uh, uh, the seat, but other young representatives, uh, because there's certainly needs that kind of direction uh, in our legislature to get things done. It can't just be a lot of talking and meetings. You've got to implement. You've got to execute. And so I hope that he will use all of his years of experience, valuable knowledge to support that effort, even if he's not officially the Speaker of the House. I think he would be tremendously valuable. And to give advice to uh, this, uh, you know, Senate president and even to the governor. Uh, everybody needs that. And Scott Psyche is certainly a wise man who can provide that kind of experience and expertise to them. Mm, amen to that. Um, you know, in Hawaii, if you look back, down the decades, you, you find that there's a kind of musical chairs process that happens. In other words, somebody serves in a particular office, they lose the office for one reason or another. You know, um, as, as a lot of politicians understand and articulate, it, it's never a guarantee. Anything could happen. You, you, can't, you can't assume you're going to stay in office forever. Um, uh, so, you know, query, um, you know, is, is we going to see him back? in some way. It's sort of a natural, isn't it, that he would run for office, another office, somehow, and insinuate himself into the legislative process as a, another, a representative uh, or some other uh, body, for example, the city council. Um, what do you think? I mean, he's not done is the point, right? Yeah, no, he's. I think he, he still has so much to offer. And I hope that he will, whether it's in the private sector or in the public arena. Uh, leadership is needed at all levels, county, state, and federal, as you've said. And uh, so I think he's going to probably take some time off uh, to recover um, and then take a look at it and see. But we have to remember, too, that, uh, you know, with that said, a lot of his uh, relationships at the state level, but then Hawaii and Honolulu in particular, such a small town. So I'm sure that if he crossed over to support any county efforts, it would be mm. greatly welcome. Speaking of um, you know other jobs, uh, you you ran for governor not too long ago, and that was a, that was a, a great race you made. Um, but one of one of the people uh, who was contending against you was Kai Kahele. Yeah, so Kai finished third in the race for governor. Um, mm. And uh, now I understand, yeah, he successfully secured a seat on OHA. Uh, I think that was with the support of a longtime trustee who decided not to run this time. And she endorsed him. And my, I'm told she actually, you know, was the one who encouraged him to run. Um, he certainly has a lot, I think, of energy and ideas. Though so, uh, the thing with Kai to me that he has to really search in his heart is why he does the things he does and it, are they for the right reasons uh, but I think he's smart he's sharp and he certainly when he speaks people listen uh, but with that said there's other things that you bring to the table as a leader so I know the last two years I hope that he's taken the time to really think about what he could do for the people and this is an important seat OHA has tremendous responsibilities. I'm sure he's fully aware of that. And I hope that he can 
deliver now in this valuable role that he has. I know there are uh, many other interesting races that are in process, um, but or have been resolved on the primary basis. But I, I do want to go to the national races with you and get your take on what's going on to Kamala Harris and uh, uh, Tim Walsh and, and the response they're getting in the various places they're speaking and what it looks like in terms of the race for presidency. Your thoughts? I think there's no question that Kamala Harris as uh, the nominee is uh, just very, I mean, while it's not official, she has the votes and she will be uh, the nominee for the Democratic Party. And she's de definitely with uh, Tim Waltz really brought the campaign to another level in terms of energy and uh, excitement and uh, optimism, you know? So I think from a campaign perspective, it's all been positive. Uh, I think this is why Donald Trump has been very negative about, you know, even going so far as to claim that the crowd she's talking about have been artificially uh, intelligenced <laughs> to put in. I mean, all these lies again. I, I really hope people see through it. Uh, but to campaign is one thing and to win an election is another thing. So certainly it's my hope that uh, Vice President Harris and Tim Waltz will carry the ticket and the country uh, into the next uh, presidency. There's been more and more news about, uh, you know, we, we, we had a big public conversation, national conversation about Joe Biden's ability, you know, his uh, acuity. Um, but now there are, there are many indications that Trump's acuity is in even greater jeopardy. Uh, because he keeps making these mistakes. Sometimes maybe they're intentional lies, but sometimes it's it's really a, a question of whether he's got his act together. I mean, mentally. Um, and so, uh, and, and there's all this possibility, you know, uh, that uh, uh, that he will further decline between now and November. Um, your thoughts about that, and your thoughts, and this goes to something you said a minute ago: whether people see it, whether they understand that, that um, this kind of decline is dangerous for the country nationally and internationally. Um, I know that, you know, you and I see it, uh, and everyone in our bubble sees it, but query, does the country see it? And if the country sees it or doesn't see it, what effect is that, that going to have? You know, it, it really brings to me to mind something that I'm really concerned about, that it's not just so much the candidate Trump, but it's what he stands for, the anger that a group of people, a, a large group of the population, um, that is what they actually want to see. They're angry, so they want a candidate who's angry. They want a president who's angry. And during his four years as president, there is no question in my mind that our country became very angry, polarized, and much of it really because it started at the highest level from the president himself, Donald Trump. And uh, we have not fully recovered from that. We used to be able to disagree with civility and we need to be able to do that and respect each other. I hope that the majority of people uh, will see that at least enough to ensure that Kamala Harris is the next president of the United States. And while yes, she's not perfect and I know people who criticize her and some with valid reason. But if you think of the alternative, we cannot even go there. It's really dangerous. And I hope people realize what is at stake. Well, I, I ask myself every day whether the media understands this, because the media plays such a huge role. And they are so often, you know, in, entranced, hypnotized by Trump's um, uh, remarkable um, and provocative statements his lies, uh, his insinuations, his, his his conspiracies and all that. And the media loves to chase him. He invited them to Mar-a-Lago for a press conference. It really wasn't a press conference. It was just him spouting his his, his crazy things. Um, and, and right after that, Kamala Harris was supposed to give a speech. She was scheduled to give a speech. She did give a speech, but the national media didn't cover it. Um, and so, you know, what you get is uh, looking for raw meat, the media looking for raw meat and thus more eyeballs, 
and thus more profit, whatever motivates them. And I am very concerned that they have a huge effect on whether the public understands what you and I've been talking about and whether um, they will you know, recognize the realities or deal in this kind of uh, momentum from before and uh, talk him up and talk her down and and uh, vote for him no matter what he does, no matter what he says. So what is the role of the media here? What would you advise the media going forward right now with 90 days to go? I don't think that media would listen to anybody. They're, they're now a business. Journalism is not the noble profession that it once was, Jay. You know, they are a business and they just run to sell news that sells. Never mind if it's legit, true or not, they just want to sell. And um, it's it's sad because it does impact our country. Uh, why do you think in so many autocratic countries, media is controlled by the government? Because it's a tool, it's propaganda that's used. Um, I hope that again, the majority of Americans, at least enough to get us to the over 50%, recognize and see media for what it is. I don't think they listen to anyone except what sells for them. So. Yeah, that's uh, regrettable because it, it recognizes, you. Rec I recognize um, that it's, it's imperfect and it has a, um, a very, sometimes a very negative effect on, on the uh, understanding of the, of the electorate and thus the voting of the electorate. We can only hope that they will um, be responsible to the democracy uh, in the next 90 days. We're out of time, Vicky. I'm so I'm so happy that uh, you came. Um, do you have any final thoughts that you wanna offer to our viewing audience? Well, I was just gonna say, that's why I appreciate uh, what you do through Think Tech, Jay. You know, because you give a platform for people from opposing sides and sides, they don't necessarily agree with you to come and just express their views. That is very important. And in closing, I would just say that, you know, the election is what it is. I think Scott Psyche is uh, very practically reflected and said the voters have spoken. And he's a wonderful example of uh, what leadership should be about, accepting the results, not trying to contest it. Uh, and being able to lend his wisdom, I hope, uh, to the next uh, government, you know, in process, new representatives, new uh, people in office, I think will be a wonderful gift to the people of Hawaii. He spent over 30 years in public office. And so I'm sure he did that because he cares about this place like we all do. So let's hope for the best in November. Hoping for the best, Vicky. I hope we can get you back on the show too. And I would like to hear your commentary as we go forward to uh, the, the most serious inflection point the country has seen in hundreds of years. Thank you so much. Vicki Caetano, former First Lady of Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Thanks for watching. Aloha.